Hello and uh, welcome everybody to the second in our series of masterclasses on winter storms. Uh, so I'm Liz Bentley, I'm Chief Executive at the Royal Meteorological Society and alongside me co-chairing today is Andrew Charlton Perez who is Head of Department at the um, University, Head of the Met Department at the University of Reading. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to um, uh, be involved in this partnership with the University of Reading to deliver this series of uh, masterclasses. Um, and I'll take you through uh, a little bit of admin before we get started and introduce our speaker for today. So today's presentation is on the impact of climate change on winter storms. Uh, and we have um, uh, our speaker who will take us through a presentation on that and then open up to uh, questions from, uh, from you as uh, delegates attending this uh, event. Uh, so first slide, if we could move on, Sam, um, I just wanted to uh, give some information about membership for those who aren't members of the Royal Meteorological Society, I'd encourage you to join. There's a little bit of information on here about the benefits of being a member. Um, but one of the particular benefits is that, you know, we are able to deliver events such as this, um, uh, these kind of activities. And if we move on to the next slide, that's really important when we think about CPD activities for those uh, who are working towards becoming a registered or chartered meteorologist or maintaining those professional accreditation standards. And that's one of the reasons why um, we came up with this uh, proposal uh, jointly with the University of Reading to deliver a series of masterclasses. We recognise the importance of providing CPD, particularly to operational meteorologists out there, and that's where the, the concept came from. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, um, just some information about Demio for those of you who are new to the system. Uh, if you have any problems uh, over the course of uh, the, the presentation, um, I would suggest you actually drop out of the, the presentation and rejoin using one of the four browsers that you see here. Uh, sometimes there are issues with other browsers, so if you're having any problems, that's possibly why. Um, if you want to make the PowerPoint slides a little bit bigger, a couple of um, activities here, so you could close the chat. Uh, by clicking on um, the icon that you can see arrowed here, or you can enlarge the screen by clicking on the two diagonal arrows to make um, the, the PowerPoint presentation a little bit bigger. But we, we would encourage you to uh, submit questions uh, du during the presentation so that when we get to the Q&A, we have a series of questions to ask. So uh, if you've got any questions along the way, then use the chat. Uh, as I see many of you using to say hello to each other, but use the chat for questions and we'll, uh, we'll come to as many of those as we can during the Q&A. So this slide uh, shows you the, the final seminar, the final masterclass in this series of three, which takes place in two weeks time on the 14th of October. And that's on sub-seasonal predictions for European winter storms uh, given by Robert Lee from the University of Reading. So I'll hand over to Andrew, who uh, will present our speaker for today. Um, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Liz. Um, and uh, just to say from the University of Reading side, we're really delighted to, to partner with the Royal Met Sock uh, on, on this masterclass series. Um, it's really exciting for us to do something uh, a little bit new uh, and to really think about how our research can, can have impact um, in the real world for people, you know, making forecasts or, or thinking about, you know, the, the impact of, of weather and, and winter storms uh, every day in, in different facets of, of their work. Um, and with that in mind, it's, it's really a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Len Chaffrey uh, today, who is a professor of, uh, of climate science at the University of, of Reading and a, a principal scientist at the National Centre for, for Atmospheric Science. Um, and I'm sure many of you will, will know of Len's work. Um, Len's led a number of, of really large projects in the UK looking at winter storms and other uh, aspects of, of extratropical climate variability. And I think, you know, what Len is, can do better than almost anyone I, I know is, is really connect that work to, to the real world and to, to um, lots of, of different industries, insurance and sort of energy and all those kinds of things. So I hope um, that this will be a really great uh, uh, talk today and uh, I'll hand over to Len. Everyone, uh, thanks very much for joining this afternoon. Uh, and thanks to the Royal Meteorological Society uh, for inviting me to give this presentation on the impact of climate change on winter storms. I'd like to start by welcoming, uh, by thanking my uh, co-workers, and particularly Ben Harvey, Peter Cook, Ryan Ed Scheiman, and Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading and in the National Centre for Atmospheric Science. They've done a lot of the work that I'm presenting today, um, so the thanks really go to them. So just to start, um, 
I'm going to give a little bit of context. So obviously the UK and Europe um, has always been affected by uh, really powerful storms. Uh, and there's lots of um, classic examples of this in the historical literature. So we can start with a storm that had a huge impact, the Great Storm of 1703. Uh, this rolled into southern England um, in uh, the 26th of November 1703. Um, it led to a massive loss of life. Uh, over 8,000 lives were lost in England and Wales alone. Extensive property damage, um, particularly of note, 400 uh, windmills were destroyed. So that had a huge impact on flower production uh, in England. Uh, and over 100 ships were sunk, including 13 ships from the Royal Navy. Moving forward a little bit further in time, another storm that had a massive impact uh, on Europe uh, was the Night of the Big Wind, or Iha Naguiha Mura. Uh, it hit Ireland on the 6th of January, 1839, uh, and similarly led to a massive loss of life. So several hundred fatalities across uh, Ireland, uh, severe damage across Ireland and Britain, and led to 42 ships being sunk. And then more recently, we can choose an example like the Great October Storm of 1987. Um, that hit on the 15th, uh, the night of the 15th and 16th of October, uh, 22 fatalities, uh, 15 million trees were felled in southern England, uh, and the insurance losses led to over £2 billion uh, pounds worth of insurance loss in the UK. So really powerful storms, intense storms have always impacted on Europe. Uh, and one of the questions that people would like to know is how might uh, these storms change in uh, a warmer world? What impact will climate change have on these types of storms? So here's an outline of my presentation. Um, I'm going to start by uh, talking a little bit about climate model projections. So what do the latest climate models say um, about um, how storms will change in the future? Um, so a good place to start with that is to ask the question, well, how reliable, how reliable are climate model projections? Uh, pro how reliable are climate models? How good are they? Uh, how good are they uh, for the purpose of actually thinking about extreme weather, such as uh, extropical storms? And then move on to talk about um, what do they actually project will happen. I'll then move on to um, observations. So uh, when we look at long-term records, have we observed changes in European storminess um, over the uh, past uh, century or so? And then I'll move on to things that we know less about. So where are the major knowledge gaps? Um, and I, you, we could write, we could spend quite a bit of time on this, but I'm going to focus on two specific things. So the first of those is post-tropical storms, and the second is sting jets. Okay, so moving on to the first of these is actually looking at climate models and um, what do climate models say in terms about how storms might change in the future. So before I get onto that specific subject, what I want to do is just spend a minute or two just talking about how we actually characterise storms. How do we actually measure how stormy the atmosphere is being? So this is quite a difficult subject. Um, for a start, there are, there are different kind of meteorological variables that we're interested in when we consider storms. So for example, do we want to consider the uh, deepest surface pressure in a storm? Do we want to consider the uh, strongest wind gusts? Um, and there's potentially other things that we might be interested in meteorologically from a storm. Of course, we're also interested in a whole range of other things from storms. So for example, how much rainfall is falling from a storm? Um, and even more complicated things. So is there a, a compound uh, risk from uh, events that have strong winds uh, and heavy floods, for example? Um, is there is the sorts of compound risk things that we want to consider? So as well as being, you know, there's various things that we want to be thinking about in terms of storms, there's different uh, methodologies that we can use to think about storms. So the first of those is on the left, which I've called statistical measures. So this is where we take a long time series uh, of a meteorological variable. Uh, and we then uh, process that time series to pull out the storm relevant information. So the example I'm showing here is looking at uh, means level pressure variance. So what we do is we take the six hourly means level pressure variance from uh, a reanalysis in this case, the era five reanalysis. Um, we look at those means level pressure variations and then we take out the high pass part of the, the time series. So we just look at the fluctuations that are occurring at less than six days. So when we look at those variations, we make some assumption that those fast changing variations are associated with extropical storms. And if we look at that variance, then we make the assumption that that's associated with the storms themselves. So the uh, map here shows um, a plot of what uh, means level pressure variance um, looks like for winter time uh, across the North Atlantic and into Europe. So you can see this maxima, those dark green colors, 
um, in this mean sort of a pressure variance, which indicates where storms go. And we, we call this feature the storm track, so it's typically where storms occur. So we have this kind of canonical idea of storms developing somewhere uh, off the eastern seaboard of the United States, uh, traveling across the North Atlantic, and then recurving northwards, say northwards of Scotland uh, and up into Scandinavia. So another way of thinking of storms is uh, the measure on the right, and that's thinking about um, storm tracking. So this is doing something slightly different from the one on the left, and that's where we take a storm-centered view. So what we do is we try to identify where storms are, either in uh, a reanalysis or in a climate model. Um, and we can do that a whole variety of different ways. So we can look for means level pressure minima. We can look for um, maxima in 850 hectopascal relative vorticity. Um, and we can look at a whole different variety of types of things. And then once we've done that, we can track where the storm goes um, using some uh, objective feature tracking algorithm. So that gives us a much more storm-centered view. And th there's kind of an example I've shown there. Um, the little blue dots are where um, the storm tracking software has identified particular storms. And then the blue lines are where they've joined individ uh, individual um, uh, identified points together into a storm track. So you can see there that we have a whole range of storms uh, moving across the uh, the North Atlantic in a way that I've just previously described. So, of course, these, the difficulty here is that we have two very different measures here, one uh, very statistical, one uh, uh, based upon these storm tracking uh, algorithms. And there's kind of pros and cons to both of them. The first method using the statistical method is simpler to implement, but we still have to make this assumption that the statistical measure we're looking at is associated with storms. The one on the right is much more focused on the physical phenomena itself. But then we get into the difficulty of uh, what storm tracking algorithm do we, do we use? And there's a lot of storm tracking algorithms out there. So if you're really interested in that, there's a, a paper by New in uh, 2013, which did a review of the, the 20 or so different storm tracking uh, schemes that are out there in the literature. Um, so there's lots of assumptions and uh, thresholds and choices to be made when we use a storm tracking algorithm. So we have some choice and trade off here between simplicity and complexity. So given this wide diversity of ways of measuring storms and thinking about storms, what, what should we do? So I, th I think the answer is that we have to kind of embrace that diversity. Um, what we have to do, though, is be very careful when we look at any uh, of, of our conclusions about how storms might change in the future, whether we observe changes, by actually looking at storms from different, in different ways, so using different measures. And if our conclusions are robust using these different measures, then that kind of adds strength to our conclusions. Um, but we do need to be careful about um, any conclusion just relies upon a single measure of storms. Okay, that's a slightly lengthy uh, aside. So I'm going to go back now to the topic of climate change. Um, so when we're thinking about climate change, uh, here are some of the uh, the kind of the grand scale pictures of climate change from the uh, last IPCC assessment report um, that came out a few years ago. Um, so the plot on the top left shows you the uh, historical. Uh, changes in global average surface temperature is the, the black line on the left hand side of that plot. And then projections from climate models um, for two different scenarios. So the blue is what's known as the RCP 2.6 scenario. So this is uh, a scenario where uh, globally we mitigate our emissions of greenhouse gases very strongly. And then the red line, um, which shows you the RCP 8.5 scenario, um, where the mitigation uh, uh, efforts are much less. So you can see differences there in terms of uh, global average surface temperature. So depending upon the future scenario, we might have changes in uh, global average surface temperature going from something like just over one degree all the way up to four degrees. So those increases in surface temperature, global average surface temperature will have a big impact on the climate system. So the figure on the bottom left shows you what might happen in terms of uh, northern hemisphere sea ice extent in September. So September is the month when the sea ice extent is at its minimum. So this is the summertime minimum in terms of sea ice extent. Uh, and again, you can see on the left-hand side, the black line, which is the historical observations of sea ice. And you can see that that's started to decline. Arctic sea ice is starting to decline um, in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in September uh, over the uh, historical record. And then again, these projections for the RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5 scenarios. So you can see, depending upon which scenario we choose, we might actually end up um, with uh, the Arctic being uh, effectively sea ice free uh, as early as something like 2040, uh, according to climate model projections. So one of the questions that we have is, um, 
what impact will these large scale changes in the climate system, so these increasing temperatures, these changes in sea ice and so on, what impact will they have on extreme weather such as uh, extropical storms? So to start off with, it's always important to ask the question is, you know, can, we, can we actually use the climate models that we look at to uh, actually infer something about how extropical storms will change in the future? And so to start with that, it's, it's always a good idea to look at the biases in climate models. So um, the figure I'm showing you here are the climate model biases from the CMIP3 models. So the CMIP3 models uh, were used to inform the third and fourth IPCC assessment reports. So the fourth IPCC assessment report came out in 2007. So these are climate models that we were using sort of 10, 15, 20 years ago. So the sort of biases that we typically saw in them. So the figure on the left just shows you the observed wintertime storminess from era five. So this means level pressure variance measure that I talked about before. And the figure on the right shows you the biases in um, about 25 or so climate models uh, from the CMIP3 ensemble. So uh, in these models that we used about 15 years ago or so, you could see quite large biases in the representation of the North Atlantic storm track. So again, here we have the DGF uh, means level pressure variance uh, from the CMIP3 models minus the era five reanalysis and model minus observations. And where we've got blue colors, we have too few storms. And where we have red colors, we have too many storms. So you can see in these CMIP3 models, what typically happened was that storms didn't do that recurvature uh, north of Scotland and up into Scandinavia, but too many storms came into central, uh, central Europe. And obviously, if we're thinking about storminess or the impacts on storminess on precipitation or coastal flooding or what have you, then uh, these biases are quite substantial. And we might be slightly concerned about using these models to make too many inferences about the impacts of storminess uh, on Europe. I'm now going to show you the biases from the latest set of projections. So these are the CMIP6 models, uh, which will be used to inform the next IPCC assessment report, which will come out uh, next year. Um, so here we have the uh, CMIP6 climate model biases. So again, um, same as before, red colors, too many storms, blue colors, too few storms. So you can see in the CMIP6 models, the uh, biases in the large scale representation of the storm track um, is, uh, is an awful lot better. Um, those biases have reduced quite substantially. So we still have small biases and still that, that kind of flavor of maybe we're getting too many storms into Central Europe and not enough into the Scandinavian and the CMIP6 models. But compared to the CMIP3 and the CMIP5 models, there's a definite improvement in terms of the representation of the North Atlantic storm track. Um, and we might feel much more comfortable about using this set of models to think about climate change and storminess. Okay, and so uh, moving on. Uh, oh, sorry, just to take, make the final point there. So I, I mentioned this thing about you know, using different measures of storminess to try and uh, make robust conclusions about these sort of things. So there's a paper that's recently come out by Matt Priestley down at the University of Exeter where they've used a storm tracking algorithm to look um, at exactly these same biases. And just to say that uh, in Priestley et al. 2020, we see exactly the same picture um, as I've just shown. So this improvement from the CMIP5 to the CMIP6 models um, and that the CMIP6 model biases are much better than in the uh, earlier um, sets of ensembles that we use for the IPCC assessment reports. Okay, so moving on a little bit, what impact do we think climate change will have on storminess? Um, there's various ways of kind of approaching this. I'm going to take the simplest approach and, and perhaps when we get to the questions, we can talk about sort of other ways of thinking about how storminess uh, and the impact of climate change upon it, how, that, how those things might interplay. Um, but we'll start off with a simpler question, which is why do we have storms anyway? And the simplest approach is just to think about energy transports in the climate system. So um, in the tropics, we have the solar radiation coming in at the top of the atmosphere. Um, that's warming up the tropics, so the tropics are relatively warm. In the poles, we have uh, um, uh, the poles cooling radiatively to space. So the poles are relatively cool. And so we have an equator to pole temperature gradient. And that large scale temperature gradient is effectively balanced by storminess in the mid latitudes. So that equator pole temperature gradient makes the atmosphere baroclinically unstable. And the response then is for storms to grow in the mid latitude temperature gradient. So storms are doing this thing where ahead of the storm, we have a warm, moist air being pulled uh, up towards the poles. And behind the storm, we have cold, dry air being pulled down behind. And so that interchange of those two air masses is acting to reduce the equator pole temperature gradient. 
So given that's this kind of the simplest way we can kind of visualize how storms, uh, why we have storms on planet Earth, um, it's useful then to think, take that picture and think about how climate change might change it. So this picture here um, shows you the changes in surface temperature um, from, in fact, it's the CMIP3 models. I mean, I could show the CMIP5 or CMIP6 models, but we get a very similar picture, at least in terms of a large scale, in terms of changes in surface temperature between the end of the 21st century and the present day. So you can see on this picture that we have oranges and purples, which means that we have warming nearly everywhere across the globe. But you can see spatially that the globe warms at different rates. So in particular, over the Arctic, um, we have a lot of warming. So the Arctic is very sensitive to climate change. So under climate change, we expect processes like the sea ice albedo feedback to lead to uh, an increased increase rate of warming uh, at high latitudes. So um, as uh, the Arctic warms up, the um, bright sea ice melts back and exposes the uh, darker surface of the Arctic Ocean. So there's an increased feedback there. There's a positive feedback in terms of warming uh, and absorption of uh, shortwave radiation into the surface. So we have, uh, under climate change, this enhanced uh, warming going on in the Arctic, sometimes referred to as Arctic amplification. So under climate change, what we actually expect to see is a reduction in the equator to pole temperature gradient. So that's kind of um, interesting because I kind of just talked about the equator to pole temperature gradient actually driving uh, storminess. So uh, under climate change, from this very simple argument, what we might expect is that if we see a reduction in the equator to pole temperature gradient, we might expect to see a reduction in storminess. So there's only one place uh, over the Northern Hemisphere where that isn't true, and that's over the North Atlantic. So if you look at that plot, you can see just over the North Atlantic that there's this uh, region of uh, light oranges and yellows. Uh, and this is a region of ameliorated warming over the North Atlantic, and that's associated with changes in the ocean currents. So as the, um, uh, the climate system warms up, there are changes in ocean currents such that the Labrador seawater comes down further north and a shift in the position of the Gulf Stream. And we end up with this region of ameliorated warming um, over the North Atlantic. So the only place that we actually see an increase in the equator to pole temperature gradient or in the meridional uh, temperature gradient um, is actually over the North Atlantic. So from that very sort of simple argument about uh, changes in uh, temperature gradient driving storminess, we might actually expect to see an increase in storminess somewhere over the North Atlantic and into Northwestern Europe. So what do climate models actually show? So these are the CMIP-5 responses to climate change. So um, again, just on the left is just the observed storminess uh, from the ERA-5 reanalysis. And the figure on the right shows you the projected climate change response. So this is from the CMIP-5 models, so the models that went into the fifth IPCC assessment report. Again, the variable here is mean sea level pressure variance. Um, this is for the RCP 4.5 scenario. So I kind of talked about the RCP 2.6 and 8.5 scenarios earlier. This is kind of a middle, middle of the road scenario that's somewhere in between these two. Um, and the plot shows you the end of the 21st uh, century uh, storminess minus the um, present day, so uh, future minus uh, historical storminess. So again, when we have red, store, red uh, colors, we have more storms. And when we have blue colors, we have less storms. So you get this, this kind of idea um, that I kind of talked about before in terms of these very simple changes in terms of uh, equated pole temperature, temperature gradient. So the plot is mostly blue. And if I showed you across the whole of the northern hemisphere, you'd see more blue, um, which suggests that storminess as a whole is going down over the northern hemisphere. Um, but there's one place where it doesn't, and that's over the North Atlantic. Um, and over northwestern Europe. And that's in response to changes in the equator pole temperature or in the meridional temperature gradient over the, uh, the North Atlantic, where ocean currents are changing. So we get um, a reduction of the order of about 10% or so um, over Scandinavia. And we end up with an increase in the order of sort of 5 to 10% in terms of storm, storminess um, in, uh, over northwestern Europe. So they're the CMIP 5 models. Um, those changes, just to make the point, those changes sort of like 5 to 10% for this scenario sound like quite small changes in terms of number, but there's always this question about what change that might have in terms of impact. Um, obviously, this means more storms coming into um, southern Europe 
possibly more storms going into northern France and into northern Germany. And that's, of course, where most of uh, most of Europe's population lives. So there's this kind of like band of cities from London to Paris to Berlin. Uh, and insurers, for example, are very worried about storms that are intense storms that go right across that path, that corridor, because they lead to large insurance loss. So under climate change, we might expect to see a few more storms coming in that way. And that potentially might have some big impacts in terms of insurance loss. So there was a report in 2017 from the Association of British Insurers, which looked at uh, insurance loss from uh, uh, a UK perspective. So um, what they found is the climate change, even though these are relatively small changes in uh, storm number, they can lead to uh, quite large changes in terms of insurance loss. Um, so they found that the one in 200 year wind storm loss might increase from something like 30% to 45% under climate change simply because of the number of storms, the actual number of storms coming into that kind of corridor between uh, London, Paris and Berlin. So what's happening in the CMIP-6 models? Um, so this is the projected climate change response from the CMIP-6 models. Um, the CMIP-6 models have a higher climate sensitivity um, than the CMIP-5 models. Um, there's a number of papers going through the literature at the moment which kind of discuss the reasons possibly why um, potentially um, there's uh, enhanced cloud feedbacks uh, in these models, which are leading to larger, uh, larger climate sensitivities. And certainly we can see the impact of that in terms of the storminess. So under the same six models, we see a very similar pattern of change um, in, uh, in the North Atlantic in Europe in terms of storminess. So a general decrease uh, over Scandinavia, um, a lot of the Northern Hemisphere in terms of storminess, but then an increase in storminess uh, over Northwestern Europe. Um, and those changes are larger, which is kind of consistent with those changes in climate sensitivity. So um, we're now seeing slightly larger changes uh, in the CMIP-6 models compared to the CMIP-5 models. So the changes here uh, are of the order sort of like 10% or so of the Northwestern Europe for the RCP 4.5 scenario. So as well as changes in terms of uh, storminess itself, uh, one question is how will associated uh, meteorological variables change? So one thing that we're of course interested in associated with storminess is uh, intense precipitation or heavy precipitation. Um, this figure is taken from a different paper. Um, so this paper is Zappa et al. 2013. I was looking at the CMIP-5 models um, and looking at increases in heavy precipitating storms. Um, and what this paper found was that there was uh, an increase in strongly precipitating storms uh, across the North Atlantic in Europe. So the um, distribution here, the frequency distribution um, shows for the solid line, um, the uh, precipitation rate uh, from uh, storms uh, using a storm uh, centered approach. So you track the individual storms and then you look at the precipitation rate around the, um, around the storm itself. Uh, and you simply just record that and then produce a frequency distribution over the domain that you're interested in. So the solid line shows some historical simulations and the dashed line shows from the future simulations in the CMIP-5 models, again, for the RCP 4.5 scenario. So uh, what's particularly interesting is what's happening in the tail. Um, and if you look at the kind of blow up in the tail, you can see quite a large change in the uh, number of heavily precipitating storms. So the kind of the headline figure that came out of this paper was that for um, heavily precipitating storms, so storms which have a, a precipitation rate greater than 90th percentile um, present day rates, um, there was an increase of about 20 to 25 percent in terms of the number of heavily precipitating storms. And that increase is kind of consistent with what we might expect from the clausius clapeyron uh, equation. So we know that um, under uh, climate change and the climate warming, um, we expect um, the atmosphere to be able to mo hold more moisture simply because the atmosphere is warmer. Um, and if we're kind of guessing that uh, you know, the changes in temperature might lead to a three degree temperature change over Europe uh, under, uh, under um, uh, future climate change scenarios, then that 3% change, um, I say that, yeah, three degree change would lead to something like a 21% change in terms of uh, moisture availability. Um, simply because yeah, for every degree that you warm the atmosphere, you get roughly about 7 degree, 7% 7 more moisture in the atmosphere. So these changes uh, in terms of uh, the number of heavily precipitating storms are pretty consistent what we might expect from uh, just kind of the warming of the atmosphere and the classic cloud product equation. Okay, so that's climate model projections. Um, 
I want you to move on a little bit now and talk uh, a bit about uh, observations. Um, so how have we observed changes in storminess? So this is a difficult thing to do because obviously we're kind of relying upon uh, long term records uh, and observations from weather station data to try and understand uh, how storminess have changed. So if we if we go back and just simply look uh, at storm reports in the past, then we find that, you know, there's a, a couple of periods uh, over the 20th century that we know have been quite stormy. So um, we know um, sort of the 1980s and the 1990s were a particularly stormy period. At the start of the 1990s, we had storms such as Daria, Daria and Vivian, which affected uh, a lot of Europe. At the end of the 1990s, we had storms such as Martin and Lothar. Uh, but also, if we go a little bit further back and look at storm reports, then we find uh, periods in the uh, early 20th century that were particularly stormy as well. So periods like the 1920s and so on. So we have a question about how do we actually want to characterize and understand storminess. It's very difficult to look at things like uh, wind speed gust records because of the, the difficulties in measuring uh, wind speeds, uh, particularly high wind speeds uh, from weather station data. There's all sorts of issues around quality control. Um, so when people have looked at long term records, they tend to have focused on uh, things such as mean slip of pressure. So uh, one paper or one set of papers that kind of started uh, a lot of the analysis were done in the 1990s, so papers by Alex Anderson as part of the WASA project. Um, and I'm showing you basically the updated results uh, uh, from using that method from a paper that came out last year uh, by Oliver Kruger. So the method here, what, what's done is, um, is what's called geostrophic wind triangles. So you take uh, pressure measurements um, from three different um, stations. Obviously, you have to do a huge amount of quality control, um, looking at the weather station data and the surface, pr surface pressure observations to make sure that you're happy with them. And once you have these three points, what you can do uh, is then effectively calculate the, uh, uh, the zonal and meridional uh, gradients of uh, surface pressure from those uh, surface observations um, and use those to calculate what's effectively the average or aggregated uh, geostrophic wind um, over uh, that triangle. So if you choose your triangles appropriately so that they're mostly over the ocean um, and you use your uh, daily or higher frequency uh, surface pressure, pressure observations, you can come up with uh, a time series of geostrophic uh, wind speeds uh, over the North Atlantic. So this figure on the top right shows you the stations that were used in the Kruger et al study. Um, and effectively what they did is come up with this long time series stretching uh, all the way back to uh, nearly 1870 um, to the present day uh, for geostrophic wind speed over that region. So then using that um, time series, they then calculate the 95th and 99th percentiles uh, of that time series each uh, each year, uh, and then looked at how that varied over time. So that's the time series that's on the plot uh, on the right here. Um, and there's uh, two smooth lines. So this is where they apply some low pass smoothing just to um, pick out any particular trends that you can see in the observations. And you can pick out straight away that, you know, these periods of, uh, in, of increased storminess, so in particular in the 1990s um, and in the early 20th century, we can see these periods of uh, increased storminess. What we don't see though is any large trends in terms of storminess. Um, in particular, if there's any trends here, then they're being masked by the very large uh, multi-decadal and interannual variability that we see in uh, records of storminess. But of course, this method kind of relies upon um, having great station data uh, in particular locations. Uh, and there's only a few weather stations uh, weather stations in in the historical record that really give that kind of uh, really great data that we can use to use a method like this. So there was a lot of hope about sort of 10, 15 years ago that maybe we could do something in terms of reanalyses. So maybe we could combine uh, atmospheric models um, and the uh, relatively sparse uh, observational network that we have that stretches back over that length of time to uh, create a, a better product. Uh, and infer something about storminess from now. So one of those products is the 20th century reanalysis. There's another long reanalysis which is produced by the European Center for Me Medium Range Weather Forecasting, ECMWF, called the ERA 20C reanalysis. Um, and effectively what we do is combine a, uh, an atmospheric model 
with the uh, surface pressure observations that we have. So we simulate the surface pressure observations into that model uh, and try to infer something about um, storminess um, from those reanalysis. Obviously, those reanalysis are used for a whole range of other products and uh, studies as well as just storminess, but that's one of the things that we'd like to uh, use from this particular context. So the uh, 20th century analysis uh, has gone through a couple of iterations. Um, the latest one, which I'll come back to again in a minute, is version three. Uh, there's some details there. So it stretches from 1836 to 2014, uses NSEP GFS and has a resolution of about 0.7 degrees. Um, and it primarily uses the uh, ISPD uh, data set, so the International Surface Pressure Data Bank, um, which is uh, a quality control data bank of surface pressure observations and stretches back as far as we can we have observations. So what happens in those um, if we use those uh, products those, such as the 20th century analysis to look at storminess? So if you kind of follow the literature there's been um, quite a debate about whether storminess is changing and um, partly that's um, due to um, people looking at products like 20th century analysis and then comparing them against observations. So when people looked in the 20th century reanalysis, they found uh, an increase in storminess um, over parts of Northwestern Europe. Um, not a very large increase, but an increase nonetheless, a significant increase in terms of storminess. So in particular, there's a paper by Donna Tal, uh, 2011, a few others uh, reporting that. Uh, when people have gone and looked in great detail though, at the 20th century analysis and also uh, at the observations and try to directly compare them, then some discrepancies have been found. So uh, the figure on the right is taken from another paper by Oliver Kruger that came out in 2013. Um, Oliver here used his geostrophic triangles uh, method um, and did that directly from 20th century analysis and then from station data to com directly compare the two things. Um, and he found a discrepancy between what 20th century analysis was doing uh, and what his station data was telling him. So there was this, uh, you can see there, the blue line is from his station data. The black line is from the 20th century reanalysis, which has some uncertainty about it because it's an ensemble um, reanalysis. Um, but you can see that there's this discrepancy between the two. And just to say that uh, for the ECMWF era 20C reanalysis, there's actually quite a strong trend in storminess in era 20C. Uh, but again, uh, when people have actually gone and looked in detail um, at the trends, they found some of the discrepancies between station observations and uh, what the reanalysis is telling us. So there's kind of a, a bit of uncertainty in the literature about whether storminess is changing. Certainly, I think the, the main take home message is that if there are any trends, then um, they're relatively small compared to the intraannual and large multi decadal variability that we see in storminess. Um, but why do we have these uncertainties? And I guess the, the, the main reason is that there's a large observational uncertainty, particularly sort of in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, if you actually look in detail in what's in things like the ISPD, the, uh, the, the data sets of surface pressure, you find that the number of observation drops off dramatically when we get to those periods. So it's actually quite difficult to use the data that we have to make uh, inferences about how storminess is changing simply because we don't have enough data in those databases. So one of the questions that we're interested in, is it possible to better constrain the observational uncertainty in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries? And I think the answer is that the, there is hope that we can do a better job. So I'm going to give an example here, which is work that's been done by Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading. Um, and this is kind of a reanalysis of the um, a storm that occurred in 1903, which is sometimes referred to as the Ulysses storm. So this storm hit uh, the uh, hit Ireland and Britain in the 26th of February 1903. Uh, it did a substantial amount of damage. Uh, in particular, it uprooted uh, 3,000 trees in uh, Phoenix Park in Dublin. Um, and the reason why it's called the Ulysses storm is that uh, in James Joyce's Ulysses, um, one of the characters actually makes a, a reference to the storm. Uh, and going up to Phoenix Park to actually look at the, the trees that have fallen down. So this is um, uh, the synoptic chart from uh, nine o'clock on the 27th of February, 1903. Um, and you can see the storm there um, centered at that point, um, kind of over Southern Scotland. Um, the central pressure of that storm from the synoptic chart is about uh, 956 millibars. 
um, at the time, uh, quite substantial gusts of over 85 miles per hour were recorded. Um, but obviously, the kind of the observational network was very um, sparse at that time, so there's probably um, much larger gusts that simply went unrecorded. This is how the uh, 20th century reanalysis, or the third version of the 20th century reanalysis, actually represents that storm. So the same kind of synoptic map uh, for the same time. Um, and you can see uh, it captures the storm. Uh, and generally, in terms of the synoptic conditions, it's not doing too bad a job. But then when you start to look at detail, you start to spot discrepancies between um, what was observed at the time and how the 20th century analysis is capturing the storm. So in particular, the storm is weaker than observed. So uh, it's got a central pressure of 965 millibars. Um, and also it's a little bit further to the Northeast. And in particular, you can see the very tight um, gradients in surface pressure in the synoptic map, uh, the contemporary synoptic map. Uh, and those pressure gradients are, are substantially more flabby, uh, not nearly as strong in the uh, 20th century reanalysis. And this is kind of one of the reasons why. So these are the surface pressure observations that uh, are currently available. So this is the um, taken from the uh, ISPD database um, for this particular time. And the yellow dots is where we have station observations that are going into constraint the 20th century reanalysis. And you'll kind of spot straight away that there are big gaps, um, particularly you know over Britain. There's a big gap there um, over Spain, over quite a lot of France. So there are gaps in terms of what data has been digitized and what data actually sits in databases like the ISPD. Um, and obviously, if we don't have uh, data constraining the reanalysis, then we'll end up with um, structures that don't, are not as intense as observations. So uh, what can be done? Um, well, there's a lot more data out there. Uh, this is a particularly uh, interesting example. So um, if you ever go to the top of Ben Nevis, you'll see uh, the remains of a meteorological uh, observatory. So from 1883 to 1904, uh, three men were employed to take hourly observations at the top of Ben Nevis. And they stayed there in all weathers, and they made uh, observations around the clock. So it must have been a particularly grim job. So you can see the picture on the right uh, is taken during the middle of winter. So you can see the kind of levels of uh, snowfall accumulation that they were working in. So it must have been quite grim conditions. So early observations were taken at uh, the top of Ben Nevis. They were also taken at Fort William uh, at the uh, base of Ben Nevis because people were interested in kind of the, the, the vertical variations in pressure and trying to understand that a bit better. But there's a huge amount of data uh, in those observations that can be uh, assimilated into, the, um, into things like the 20th century analysis, if only they were in the right format. So the moment they're sat in log books, or they were sat in log books, um, but no one had ever digitized them. So as part of a citizen science project uh, called weatherrescue.org, uh, people uh, around the globe, you know, citizen scientists have been logging on and actually digitizing these observations. So uh, around 4,000 volunteers have actually rescued nearly 4 million uh, observations so far. So as well as the uh, observations from the top of Ben Nevis and from Fort William, there's a whole range of other uh, undigitized uh, logbooks sitting around, in particular Met Office daily weather reports. So there's some daily temperature, pressure, and rainfall observations from a whole range of uh, locations across Europe, which um, have not been digitized. Um, and as well, whether uh, rescue.org has been digitizing some of those uh, reports as well. So we can take those new observations and we can say, uh, what impact will that have? Uh, on things like the 20th century analysis. So this is uh, a plot. The yellow dots are kind of the, the data that we're using uh, for the default version of the 20th century analysis. The black dots are the new observations that have been um, uh, digitized for this 1903 storm. Um, and you can see the impact that that has on the 20th century reanalysis. So the figure on the left was the uh, original plot that I showed you with this slightly flabby 1903 storm. And then the figure in the middle shows you the 20th century analysis plus the new observations. And you can see that that does a much better job. The uh, central pressure is probably still uh, weaker than observed, um, but certainly the synoptic structure of the storm is somewhat better. It's better placed. And also we have this increase in the uh, pressure gradient to the south uh, west of the storm, which is kind of what we expect for the European wind storm. 
And there's a lot more data out there. So this is uh, another plot from Ed um, from all the data that could potentially be digitized for 1903 that he's aware of. So you can see that there's um, an awful lot of data that potentially we could be using to bring to bear to get a better understanding of um, these storms that have occurred in the past. So um, there is some hope that maybe we might be able to do more in terms of data recovery to actually constrain some of the observational uncertainty uh, for the late 19th and early 20th century for trying to answer these questions or address these questions about how storminess is changing. Okay, so I'm just going to move on in the last bit to uh, major knowledge gaps. Uh, so post-tropical storms and sting jets. So just very briefly touch upon both of these. And there's, there's kind of a common feature to both of these um, in that uh, we're kind of, you know, there's questions about the kind of models that we use uh, in uh, things like CMIP and in the IPCC assessment reports to represent really, really intense features in storms. So just to take the first of these, uh, post-tropical storms. Um, so one example of that is Storm Ophelia, which hit um, uh, Ireland in the 16th of October 2017. Um, so a very uh, intense major hurricane in the East Atlantic, tracked north, uh, underwent uh, extropical transition and became a very intense extropical cyclone that hit Ireland and did a substantial amount of damage there. So one of the interesting, interesting things about Storm Ophelia, that the, uh, the major hurricane that um, kind of initiated this extropical storm uh, was the uh, most e eastern major hurricane that was ever recorded. Um, so of course one of the questions there is, um, well, is, was that just by chance or is climate change playing a role? So in particular, as uh, surface temperatures warm up in the North Atlantic, does this mean that um, major hurricanes can track further north over these uh, warmer sea surface temperatures. And if they can track further north, then can they undergo extratropical transition more frequently? And will that lead to uh, an increase in the number of post-tropical storms in the future? So one of the issues that we have when we're using um, the sort of models that we use for the IPCC assessment reports is that they're quite low resolution models. So typically those models in the atmosphere have a resolution of about a degree or so. Um, and that might be okay for capturing the large scale structure of uh, a synoptic storm in the extratropics and uh, the position of the jet stream. But when we want to get down to the details of thinking about uh, a tropical extropical transition, then that's pretty inadequate. So in particular, we need very high resolution in order to resolve anything that looks like uh, a tropical cyclone uh, and to capture kind of the mesoscale circulations around the eye of uh, a major hurricane. So in terms of actually trying to address this question, there have been some attempts uh, at doing that. Um, so the figure uh, at the bottom here is taken from a paper that came out in 2013. So this is from um, a relatively high resolution climate model. So high in climate model world means resolutions of about 25 kilometers or so. So even at 25 kilometers, that's still inadequate to capture a lot of the structure um, in terms of uh, a major hurricane. Um, but at least you get stuff that kind of intense vortices. So uh, at least it's moving towards trying to address the question about um, changes in post-tropical storms. So in this paper, uh, Harmser et al. 2013, um, they looked in the high resolution model for present day and future uh, simulations for post-tropical storms. The figure on the left shows the post-tropical storms that they found um, in their present day simulations that led to hurricane strength winds in Europe. And they only found a handful of these events um, in their multi-decadal simulation with the high resolution climate model. When they did the future uh, simulations, obviously the sea surface temperatures are much warmer. And that meant that tropical cyclones could track further, much further north um, in the uh, North Atlantic. And so there were much more post-tropical storms, uh, intense post-tropical storms in the future simulations. So there's roughly about a fourfold increase in the number of post-tropical storms uh, in these climate model simulations. So obviously this is a single model uh, and they use a single methodology to look at that and I started my talk by talking about the difficulties in trying to characterize storms and the need to have uh, multiple perspectives on that in order to draw any uh, strong conclusions. So um, there's questions here that we should raise about the, um, or caveats we should raise about, um, you know, just using a single model to look at this. So um, the literature is kind of evolving and certainly as part of the next IPCC assessment report, there's gonna be a, a project called high res 
where a range of models uh, using uh, resolutions uh, of 25 kilometers or higher are going to be examined. So hopefully we're going to look at a whole range of these different models and we'll be able to draw uh, much more robust conclusions about the impact of climate change in post-tropical storms. The second uh, example, which is the example I'll finish on, is a slightly more controversial one. Um, so this is thinking about sting jets and climate change. Um, so sting jets are very small scale, mesoscale features in uh, extropical storms. Um, they typically happen um, within the cloud head. So there's a descending branch of air coming down from the cloud head. Um, sometimes that air, as it reaches the, uh, the boundary layer, can lead to an enhancement of gustiness. Uh, this is referred to as a sting jet. Um, and that in, basically as the descending air hits the top of the boundary layer, the enhanced gustiness can lead to some very strong damaging winds in the boundary layer. So there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago, Martinez Alvaredo et al, uh, 2018. Um, again, they were looking in um, high resolution uh, climate models. So again, this means about 25 kilometers uh, horizontal resolution. Um, one of the things that we know about sting jets is that if you want to resolve them in an atmospheric model, you need much higher resolutions um, than that in order to capture some of these small scale, mesoscale circulations. Um, so they weren't directly simulating sting jets in this model, but they were looking for what called sting jet precursors. So in particular, they were looking for large values of slantwise cape. Um, and using that, uh, those estimates of sting jet precursors, uh, to try and infer what might happen to the number of sting jets uh, in the future. So in their paper, what they found is that the uh, number of models, uh, the number of storms in the North Atlantic, intense storms in the North Atlantic, that potentially might lead to sting jets that had these sting jet precursors, increased from about 30% uh, of storms in the uh, present day simulations up to 45% for the future climate. So the, simply because the atmosphere is warmer, uh, there's more moisture, uh, there's a large increase in slantwise, uh, slantwise cape uh, in, this, in this particular model. So uh, again, just this, this warming leading to, or thermodynamic warming leading to increase in slantwise cape. Um, so a kind of an inferred uh, increase in the number of sting jets in the future. So again, some caveats need to be raised here. So this is the major knowledge gap. Um, first of all, this was a single model study. So again, we need to look in multiple climate models. Um, we might be slightly worried about thinking, you know, looking in models of 25 kilometers resolution, we might want to wait until we've got um, models with much higher resolution that can directly represent sting jets before we want to make too many inferences. And also there's some questions about our, our kind of current understanding of what drives a sting jet. So uh, in this paper, they looked at uh, slantwise cape um, and whether that's a precursor for um, sting jets, um, but also, um, the other, there's other ways of trying to get sting jets. So for example, frontal lysis processes. So should we be looking at those sorts of precursors as well for sting jets? Okay, so just to summarize, so how will uh, European winter storms respond to climate change? So one piece of good news is that the biases that we saw in early uh, uh, CMIP ensembles is much reduced in the latest CMIP-6 models. Uh, under climate change, we might expect increases in roughly about 10% in terms of storminess over northwestern Europe for the uh, RCP 4.5 scenario. In terms of long term observations of European wind, winter storms, uh, generally you find trends are quite small compared to the large interannual and decadal variability in terms of storminess. But we do have questions about the uncertainty, the observational uncertainty in the late 19th and early 20th century, and hopefully data recovery might help there. Um, there's lots of major knowledge gaps. So in particular, we're using quite low resolution climate models to try and infer what's going on in terms of storminess. But there's lots of questions about you know, small scale features uh, and diabatic processes and things like latent heating and so on, and how they may drive changes in storminess in the future. Um, and at the moment, um, we really don't have the right tools to try and tackle this. So um, things like high resume uh, hopefully should lead to sort of more robust uh, uh, changes in terms of our knowledge about how these uh, phenomena might change in the future. So I will uh, draw uh, it to a close there. So thank you very much for listening. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, give you a round of applause in the chat rather than, but I'll, I'll give a round of applause for, for everyone. Um, and so uh, what are the what are the features that we've uh, 
started out with these masterclasses, which I think was was really good, is is that uh, we've asked uh, some end users of this information to to respond. So I'm going to hand over to Liz now um, for a, for a response to your to your talk. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce uh, two operational meteorologists who have agreed to. Uh, put into context, I guess, what the presentation from Len means to them as operational meteorologists. So I'm delighted uh, that we've got Paul Knightley, who is um, the man forecaster manager at DTN, formerly known as Meteor Group. And we've got Dan Surrey, who is one of the chief, op chief operational meteorologists at the Met Office. Uh, so if I can get you both to join and uh, just a few minutes each, really, starting with Paul, just to take us through, I guess, your uh, your personal opinion on the, on the presentation and the information there in, in the context as a, an operational meteorologist and how you use this information. Well, thanks very much, uh, Liz, and good afternoon, everyone. And, and thanks also to Len for, for a fantastic uh, talk there. Um, I think as far as, you know, operational meteorology is concerned, it's always that link between something that can appear slightly ethereal, you know, a, a climate change projection versus the the kind of here and now. And on the eve of what looks like a rather stormy spell over the next few days in northwestern Europe, it's very apt that we're talking about these kind of storms just at the moment. Um, I mean, we, we were thinking about this the other day. I mean, I, I think the, the main concern as a, of an operational meteorologist with increased storminess is is you now our ability to be able to see these in, in operational models. And whilst big winter storms you know can be quite well modeled we've seen some of these big ones over the years you you see them several days or even you know sometimes up to a week out when the jet stream is is well captured in the models uh, versus uh, that they can be quite easily communicated but the, the flip side of that is these transitional storms you know the ophelia that we had we had storm ellen a few weeks back in an island which uh, kind of erupted almost out of nothing seemingly and models didn't really pick up very well more than two or three days ahead the, the, the ingredients were there but the actual you know the storm to convey it to customers and end users was was missing for a, you know up until fairly close by so these what might be classed as almost hybrid you know transitional storms from tropical to post-tropical uh, further east so closer to northwest europe closer to the uk you know really is something that we would be keeping a close eye on so it's interesting to see that that, that at least some models are suggesting those kind of storms might be you know more frequent in the future and just one other concern which is um you know not not well sort of i guess perhaps people don't think about it too much but quite often these major winter storms that are developing very rapidly explosive cyclogenesis on the north side of them you know intense precipitation a chilly air mass um, light winds you can get these sort of evaporative cooling as we call them or latent heat of, of melting you know, really heavy snow events you know so we could see you know more disruptive short-term snow events from some of these storms moving through as well which again can be quite hard to predict on the short term and given more moisture in the atmosphere in a warmer world we could see you know those brief short spells of snow they can be intense just a few hours but we saw them a few winters ago a couple of episodes through parts of the south midlands where you know 20 25 centimeters of snow fell in three or four hours time whilst areas to the south across southern england were getting blasted with strong winds so yeah i think there's a lot to to, to take in um, um and it's all about how we would communicate that i guess so yeah that would be my side of things uh, from an operational met perspective uh, at dtn Thanks, paul uh, dan yeah, um, I can echo a lot of Paul's comments there, and thanks for a really great and interesting talk there, Len. Um, Len's been involved in a number of really good papers about climate change and extropical cyclones, so it's obviously well worth Googling him and checking out um, some of his papers. I had a flick through a few of them in the last couple of days, and there's some really good stuff. Um, from an operational perspective, it strikes me that we in the weather forecasting industry are going to see increasing challenges from winter extropical cyclones in the face of an increasing chance of warmer and wetter winters and wintertime storms being more likely to bring higher rainfall totals and obviously the increased risk of high wind and high rainfall events as well, particularly if we get more post-tropical and high wind events from sting jets. I suppose there's also a question mark regarding how predictable storms will be. Will we see more smaller scale features that are inherently more unpredictable or will instead there be an opportunity to extend and enhance predictability in some fashion um, to longer lead times? And yeah, like Paul says, whilst we believe the chances of colder winters will be smaller, there's still going to be some colder events, so how will they manifest themselves? Either way, the other thing is that I think um, impact-based forecasting will remain central to many types of uh, weather forecasting, particularly public service warnings or warnings for emergency services, such as the National Sphere Weather Warning Service that we do at the Met Office. And to help us here, I think what we need is increasing 
high quality objective decision aids um, for this impact based forecasting, which probably means more partnership work with other environmental science organizations to try and develop better tools and perhaps even ultimately some sort of integrated 24 seven environmental hazard prediction super center um, to be able to sort of properly or better communicate the full gauntlet of potential um, hazards and impacts. At the same time, as I think back to how tools have changed and developed over the span of my forecasting career, no doubt over the coming 20 or 30 years, both deterministic and ensemble models will improve as technology develops and we gain the benefit of things like machine learning, new satellites and so on. And this will hopefully increasingly allow the forecasting community to add more value by communicating or better communicating the so what of a weather event. And at the same time, I think what we also need actually is better tools to try and help with the contextualization and attribution of weather events in um, terms of climate change and yeah once again great talk Len thanks a lot thanks Dan Paul um, you're going to hang around obviously for the Q&A um, we've, we've had quite a few questions actually come in so we've got quite a few to go through but if there are any more questions can I encourage you to type them into the chat and we'll, we'll get through as many of those as we can so I'm going to invite uh, Len back um, and uh, we'll put Len's talk up as well because some of the earlier questions are based on some of your slides, Len. So I don't know if we can actually go back to the beginning of the presentation. Um, the slide that you had, the Arctic amplification uh, slides are very near the beginning. It was just a few slides in. So you had the global map showing the uh, increased temperature, that one. Yeah, perfect. So it was a, it's a quick question, but it was just to do, it may, you may not know the answer to this, it's the legend that should appear with this, uh, with this image. Um, I don't know, I presume it will be uh, available in a paper, but I guess it's the scale of, of the, 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 the temperature um, anom anomalies that are on here. Yeah, sorry, I should have um, I should have put that on. <laughs> That's missing. So yeah, so uh, it so the purples will be about six, seven degrees, possibly a little bit more. Um, and uh, typically, the the kind of the oranges, the dark oranges, will be about three degrees, and the light um, light yellows will be about one degree. Great. Okay. So uh, and then there were a couple of questions picking up on the next slide. So this was uh, CMIP five um and uh, it was the if you move on to your next slide len yeah so the i think it was relating to the uh the image on the right hand side there was a question around um uh so let me uh, click open the box it says this figure appears to show 0.25 hectopascal increase in mean sea level pressure i.e less stormy relative to the 30-year historical period i guess a question and I'm assuming actually those are showing an increase in storm and it's not a decrease. Yeah, so the red colours there are more storms, so there's an increase in mean level pressure variance. So, uh, you know, in that less than six day vary, um, uh, time period, so, uh, so, so oh, that frequency band, so, so this is an increase in storminess, the red colours, uh, the blue colours are uh, a decrease in storminess. Great, and, and staying on this, um, I think it was related to the same slide for Mario, uh, asking about um, are there more Azores high pressure dominance further east? Does, do you see a signal coming from CMIT 5 on that? Um, so, I mean, people haven't really looked at it in that specific detail. People have started to look at blocking. Um, and, and, again, and again, there's a whole set of issues about how you actually define blocking. Um, and the general, the general perspective is that there's this decrease in blocking. So you tend to see this kind of uh, extension of the storm track. Uh, under climate change, so more storms uh, and a decrease in blocking over uh, over Europe. Um, so those two things tend to go hand in hand. Uh, in terms of the specifics of uh, kind of the Azores High, um, yeah, it's it's. I don't think as anyone's really looked at it in that in that kind of detail. But in terms of blocking events, we tend to see a decrease. Okay, great. So we've got quite a few questions actually around CMIP six. So let's start with this first one from Aaron. So in your opinion. Um, Len, are the CMIP6 models too sensitive to climate change? And if so, what can be done to correct or adjust this potential bias? So I think that's a really interesting question. So the, you see this increase in climate sensitivity between the CMIP5 and the CMIP6 models. I think we're starting to understand um, why that is. Whether they're too sensitive, it's quite difficult to um, come to that conclusion um, given that you know we kind of tend to you know all we, what we tend to do is we tend to think about the climate model projections um and the climate sensitivities that they produce 
uh, as all being, uh, you know, quite realistic possibilities for the future because all the, you know, the models are constrained against observations, et cetera, um, and they should be able to produce, um, you know, the, the projections that we produce, if, if they're within the, the kind of, they're evaluated against the observations, they're doing an okay job, then the projections are just as likely as any other. So, so it's difficult to dismiss those models without some uh, a priori evidence. It'll be interesting as um, the amount of valuation that goes on on the CM6 models continues, um, whether we'll find ways of um, looking at models and say, actually, that's not consistent with the historical record and therefore we should disregard um, their particular projections. Um, so at the moment, I think it'll be difficult for the IPCC to uh, disregard those models um, or adjust for them um, simply because, you know, they're, they're well evaluated models at the moment and they look like they're doing a decent job with the historical record. Great. Uh, so a couple of questions from Victoria. The first one, again, relating to CMIP-6. So how well do CMIP-6 models capture the Mediterranean storm tracks and how do they predict uh, that that's likely to change in the future? So, yeah, so one of the things I didn't mention, and I think this is, this is a really good point, is that um, when you look at something like mean stuff pressure variance, it's actually a really bad uh, measure for looking at um, Mediterranean storms. So um, uh, Mediterranean storms don't tend to be as deep as North Atlantic storms. Uh, they tend to be much more small scale. So when we look at mean stuff pressure variance, we don't tend to see a big signal in terms of those, in terms of Mediterranean storms. What we need to do is use a feature tracking algorithm uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, and when we do that, I mean, we can we can see that models capture uh, Mediterranean storms uh, reasonably well. Um, some of the models do better than others in regard to that. Um, in terms of the changes, um, there's actually quite large changes in the Mediterranean. So um, one of the things that I didn't talk about was kind of um, changes and shifts, uh, particularly in the subtropical jet um, under climate change. So under climate change, we get an enhancement of the hydrological cycle that tends to shift the uh, subtropical jet further north. Um, and that has an impact on the Mediterranean storm track. So there's quite a large decrease uh, in terms of uh, the number of storms over the Mediterranean under climate change projections. Um, and that's associated with the quite large decrease in, in terms of wintertime Mediterranean precipitation that's seen in these models as well. So those two things tend to go hand in hand. So climate models uh, predict that the Mediterranean becomes substantially less stormy because of this northward shift in the subtropical jet over the Mediterranean, um, but also a decrease in precip there as well. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, another question from Victoria again on the CMIP models. So. Is there any evidence in CMIP models that wind gusts in extra tropical cyclones increase more than uh, the wind, the mean winds, i.e. gusts likely to become more extreme uh, and uh, more effective downward transport of momentum through the boundary layer? No, we don't we don't see any evidence of that. I think I think partly we need to be slightly um, I think that's partly because the models, uh, you know, they've all got the boundary layer parameterizations. Some of these models are quite low resolution, etc. So um, I think I think we're probably when we get to sort of those details of some things like momentum transport through the boundary layer um, in the uh, CMIP six models or in the CMIP five or CMIP three models, then we we somewhat worried about how well they represent some of those processes. So um, at the moment, I would I would kind of say yeah, the models are probably um, the models are a little bit all over the place in terms of how they represent those processes. So they're probably not the best set of models to look at for that specific question. I'd say. Okay, great. Um, so question from John. Uh, it seems like the increased storm intensity in future is relying on North Atlantic cooling, increasing temperature gradients. How good are the ocean forecast part of CMIP 6? Yeah, so it's, um, uh, that's an interesting question as well. So the, there's quite a bit of uncertainty in the, uh, in the models in terms of the model spread. It's probably best to talk about model spread rather than uncertainty. So there's, there's quite a model spread in terms of how European storminess will change. And that's largely due to the uncertainty, partly in the um, how much North Atlantic cooling occurs, um, but also how much um, Arctic sea ice decline happens uh, further north. It's kind of a combination of those two things. Um, and uh, yeah, so so if we want to uh, constrain the uncertainty in, in projections of storminess, then the way we start is by trying to constrain some of these changes, say in ocean currents. So um, in terms of how well they do, so the all the models re, uh, capture, or all the models show that there'll be changes uh, of that sign. So there's kind of like a robust response 
in the models and we understand some of the physics behind that in terms of the slowdown of the uh, thermohaline circulation in the North Atlantic. So that's kind of in terms of an overall sort of understanding of the physics that makes sense. Um, but when we get down to the details about whether a model um, slowed down, slow down to thermohaline circulation and leads to small changes uh, in ocean circulation or large changes in ocean circulation, then there's some uncertainty there. Uh, and that uncertainty directly uh, directly feeds into the uncertainty in the storm projections. So it's an area it's an area of uncertainty that we want to work on. Great, thanks. And I think this is linked, but it moves on to more of the, of the observation sections of your talk, but it, it focuses on oceans again. So a um, few questions here. Uh, <clears throat> when giving reasons for changes in storminess in North Atlantic, surely changes globally are more um, are important drivers affecting planetary scale, atmospheric waves, amplitude, etc. And are ocean currents changing in the North Pacific? So are we seeing any changes uh, in that region? So we certainly see changes in the uh, in the North Pacific and in the tropical Pacific. So over the uh, tropical Pacific, we see changes in the Walker circulation, the changes associated with changes um, in the uh, SST gradient across the tropical um, Pacific. Um, uh, basically, you know, sort of a weakening of the Walker circulation um, that has some uh, impact certainly over the North Pacific. Um, and you know we see as i said we see changes in the subtropical jet associated with changes in the hydrological cycle so we do see all these changes and certainly all these things are kind of having an impact i mean i kind of simplified things for the talk to try and make it you know as, as tractable as possible um which is that you know you can interpret a lot of the changes in storminess in terms of changes uh, large scale changes in the equator pole temperature gradient um these other of things are having an effect and, uh, and, and particularly of uh, um, in summertime, we see um, kind of the changes in the tropics having much more of an effect um, for, for the North Atlantic. So the, the changes in the North Atlantic are kind of dominated by those changes in the Arctic. Um, and that Arctic amplification kind of reaches a maximum um, kind of in wintertime and uh, uh, in springtime. So when we get into summertime, the, the Arctic amplification is less. Um, and so you see more impact from what's going on in the, from those changes in the tropics. So there's kind of a seasonal dependence there. Um, certainly they're important, you know, and I, and I did simplify things for the, for the presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, can, we can do, I think to a first order, uh, uh, try and interpret the changes in storminess of uh, the North Atlantic and Europe in winter time in terms of changes in lower tropospheric barophonicity. Great. I think following on from that or linked with that, there's a couple of questions around the Gulf Stream. So the first one says, um, I know the Gulf Stream intensity will decrease according to the scenarios. Maybe this influence uh, the low frequency stormy periods in future question. Yeah, that'd be that's an interesting question. So I, I focus mostly here on storminess. Um, there's a lot of uh, it depends, I guess. Depends what you mean by low frequency. Um, I mean, whether you mean kind of sub seasonal variations or uh, interannual variations or even longer term uh, variations. Um, so it certainly will be interesting to think about uh, what impacts uh, changes in the large scale environment might have um, on, uh, you know, kind of things like windstorm clustering. Um, so, you know, where you have sort of sub seasonal variability like in 2013 14. Um, where we had, you know, very strong double-sided Rossby wave breaking around the jet, um, which uh, led to this enhanced period of storminess. If we change the large-scale environment, um, whether that's through Arctic amplification or changes uh, in sea surface temperature associated with the slowdown of the Gulf Stream, what impact will that have uh, on those kind of sub-seasonal uh, variations? So I think that's an interesting question that I don't think we've really got to the bottom of yet. Okay, great. Um, so moving on, um, question, uh, uh, so this is, has the synoptic map from 1903, uh, how, sorry, how was the synoptic map from 1903 made? Were all the observations uh, that now need to be rescued av are available? So, okay. um, so that's, that was the contemporary map. So that was the map that was made um, in the Met Office on the day. So I, I'd imagine, uh, I'd, I'd I, I don't know the, the exact details, but I imagine that's a hand-drawn map taken from uh, the observations that were uh, telegraphed in um, uh, during the, just before the, the time that the, the synoptic map was made. Um, so it's the, it's the actual map that was, that was used to do the, you know, the weather forecasting on the day. Um, in terms of the second question, so of, of all the observations that need to be rescued, um, this, there's more out there. So um, I think, I, you know, I kind of, 
showed uh, in terms of the um, the 20th century reanalysis, for example, what the impact on the 20th century analysis was when we included the Ben Nevis observations plus some of the uh, Met Office weather uh, daily weather report observations. And you can see an improvement, but it still wasn't as, um, you know, there's still some discrepancies between the synoptic map and the 20th century analysis plus the new observations. And I did show one uh, slide from Ed uh, Hawkins that had uh, the potential to, to increase that. So there's actually a lot of other observations that one could bring to bear um, and to constrain uh, something like the 20th century analysis. So there's a lot more out there that we could use. Um, and I, I, in terms of you know the word need, it's always a question of how far do you want to go. Um, if we're if we're interested in looking at something like the 1903 storm and really understanding you know, just how um, how intense it was, then um, I think you know ideally you'd want to bring all those observations to bear uh, on that analysis. So so there's certainly more that we can do. Right, thank you. Uh, so question from Isabel: uh, How much can the increased storminess you mentioned uh, in the 1980s, 1990s be attributed to natural climate variability of the NEO being notably strong and positive during this time? Yeah, hopefully, um, yeah, I, I didn't explicitly say that in the talk, but I think, you know, a lot of those multi-decadal vari multi variability that you see, um, for example, from the Kruger paper, um, those variations are uh, variations associated with the large-scale circulation. So, for example, um, increases in the North Atlantic oscillation during that uh, during those times. So these, these things are linked. I mean, we know that there's a relationship between the NEO and storminess over Europe. Um, so we would expect physically for these things to be linked. So um, yeah, if you want, if, if we if we want to interpret the the, the increase in storm during the 1990s to is to a period of uh, enhanced NAO, more positive NAO, then I think that's a you know, that's a perfectly fine narrative to go with. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask Paul to actually join us. So one of the questions was it's more of an observation, really, from what Paul had mentioned in his summing up. Um, so it says here, good observation, Paul, on the lack of storm warning with operational models. We can reflect on climate models' ability to predict these. And I, I just wondered if either of you kind of had a view on, uh, I guess, the, uh, the the improvement in, in the climate models. And I guess you, you touched on that at the beginning, uh, Len, with, you know, changes in the biases that we've seen from early CMIPs to the current CMIP um, and, and how that might help, I guess, in, in kind of future predictions in an operational sense. I mean, I, I would defer to Len on the on the climate models basis. I mean, I'll, I'll very briefly touch on 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 you know what I would use the the numeric weather no, the, excuse me numerical weather prediction models that they definitely have got better overall. Of course, uh, over the years, you know, we we talked about uh, Len mentioned the eighty seven storm, which was a sort of almost a classic uh, turning point in, uh, in in our in our understanding and, and study of these uh, big storm events. So, you know, undoubtedly we're seeing uh, much better modelling on the short term. You know, for operational uh, perspective. But we still have these storms that appear at short range. But uh, you know, I think Len should perhaps comment on the climate model's ability to predict them in inverted commas, because I'm not sure they necessarily predict them per se. Yeah, I mean, when we when we run a climate model, then we um, uh, you know we we have no initial condition information, so um, we're effectively generating a set of synthetic weather events. Um, so there's. I, I guess we kind of get, you know, if we want to ask the question about the sort of storms that we were not able to capture, or we find difficult to capture in a, a numerical weather uh, prediction, um, how well a climate model would capture them, then we, we kind of need to characterize what the storms are uh, and then ask, then go to look at the climate models and see how well they captured those specific storms. Um, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I think the, the, the interaction between uh, numerical weather prediction and climate modeling is, is kind of interesting. You, you can, because they are the same models, I mean, they're just physical models. Um, of the atmosphere, um, you can you can play fun games and actually uh, try and predict um, or fo do forecasts with a climate model. And we have we have tried that in the past, which is quite interesting. So we did um, forecasts of the uh, 2007 um, storm uh, that brought the flooding to uh, Chesapeake in southern England in July 2007. Um, and you know the the climate model did an okay job in terms of actually doing a weather forecast, which is quite interesting given it's such low resolution. Um, and obviously it didn't capture a lot of the detail. Uh, and if you're going to feed that through to a hydrological model, you probably wouldn't do a great job in terms of capturing flooding. Um, but in terms of capturing like, you know, enhanced precipitation over the uh, over Southern England, it did an okay job, uh, which is quite interesting. So it's it's quite useful. It's quite a useful way of trying to evaluate how well these models can 
do these sort of things is try to um, predict past events, past extreme events using a client model. Great. Uh, and if you stay on, Paul, as well. So we had a, a question comment from Lars. So good point about the potential changes in the number of small scale, rapidly intensifying systems rather than the more classic, broader scale features in future climate. Just wondering. So the, I think in your uh, summing up, Paul, you were mentioning the, the system that had snow to the north and strong winds to the south. Uh, also wondering how wet snow events uh, on northern flanks of, of deep systems that, Paul, you mentioned, may play out even with um, a generally warming background because of the increases in intensity of precipitation and cooling rates. So uh, maybe a question for you both there. Yeah, I mean, I, for, from my side, I mean, I think, you know, even even in, um, you know, a, a warming world, winter is still winter. Mm -hmm. And um it only needs to be, you know, a degree or two above zero degrees um, with an intense precipitation event to to bring the wet bulb level down in light winds and, and give a heavy snowfall event. So um, y even though the, the sort of uh, outbreaks of very cold air or, or perhaps we should say, you know, the general coldness of a winter, um, you know, we're already seeing is becoming less over the years. You only have to go back a couple of years to see the infamous east from the east to show that you know it, even in a warming world you still you know this the arctic is still cold and, and, and especially over parts of eurasia is incredibly cold at times in the winter so you know you can still get big cold outbreaks but i think regarding a warm world and storminess um you know these, these storms have, have always been multifaceted in their um uh, sort of impacts and uh, so snow on the northern side of these things is nothing new um I, I just think it's you know it's something we need to still sort of consider when we talk about increased storminess is that um, whether that means an increased uh, potential of heavy wet snow events, I don't know. It depends exactly on the storm track of the system, of course. You know, Len was talking about radional gradients as well. Maybe that means more storms coming in from the southwest, which would be less uh, conducive to that event. Usually you want one coming in from the west or west-northwest to get a good snow event on the northern side. But yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it, they're always fascinating storms. And I, you know, we, we still will see, I think, intense snow events on these systems in, in the future. There's no reason to, to think not. Perhaps Len would comment as well. I, I think it's a fascinating question about, um, yeah, whether we'll see um, more or less events where, you know, kind of the northern flank, you get these kind of heavy snow events. Um, I. It's, it's 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 I think it's useful um, in terms of having these discussions about you know what the impacts of storms are. So I guess um, certainly as a climate scientist, is the tendency to focus on the more broad scale and larger scale features. So you know intense winds, heavy precipitation, etc. But then the reality is that the impact uh, is actually you know as you say this it's this multifaceted storm that comes from a particular direction and has a particular structure, and then the impact is occurring in a certain place. Um, and if we want to uh, really ask these very detailed questions about how that impact is going to change, then we have to bring all that that knowledge uh, of the synoptic meteorology to bear on the climate models and sort of ask, you know, do these specific storm changes in the specific ways. And so it's useful to have that discussion to remind uh, certainly climate scientists that, you know, that it's the impact that matters and um, that, you know, sometimes we need to get down to this detailed meteorology to uh, actually you know, ask, ask these, these very specific questions. Brilliant. Thanks both. Really, really interesting. Uh, so conscious of time, I'm going to uh, raise one more question, Len. Uh, this is on the sting jets. So towards the end of your talk, um, I'm conscious there are other questions on here. And what I'm going to suggest is we just capture these and maybe we'll we'll respond back um, to those delegates that have attended in slower time because we're probably not going to have time to get through all the questions. So quick question on sting jets. Um, so this is have have uh, sting jets, I guess, been recorded at other locations outside the UK? I think your slide very much referred to uh, with a UK focus. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on sting jets, um, but I know I, I'm certainly aware of uh, people at Tim Houston and so on talking about sting jets, for example, in Portugal. Um, so uh, I'm aware that the other people have talked about sting jets in other parts of Europe. Um, as to the prevalence of them in other areas, I, I, I'm afraid I'm not. Uh, an expert in that. I, I guess Ellen Dacre would be yeah, the ideal yeah. person who gave the previous masterclass. Yes, yeah, exactly. So it, it was covered on the first masterclass. So a, a good a good little yeah. plug for that. It's recorded. People can go and have a look. But Dan, I don't know if you want to say a few words on that. Well, yeah, I mean, there's certainly been some evidence that Sting Jets have been recorded in other parts of um, certainly Northwestern Europe and Scandinavia. I mean, the original uh, some of the original thinking about sting jets came from Norway with Norwegian meteorologists talking about a sting in the chair, a poisonous sting in the tail of a backbent occlusion. So uh, I guess you get some in um, 
in, in Norway, but there's certainly been evidence to suggest that you've got that they've occurred in parts of Holland and Belgium and um, Germany and uh, Switzerland as well as Denmark and, and again France and uh, Spain and Portugal as well. So a number of countries have obviously been affected by um, sting jet type phenomena. Um, whether they occur more broadly a uh, field is, is, a, is a more difficult question. Um, certainly the, the research that I've seen about it has focused very much on looking at the North Atlantic and what little I've heard from um, the US suggests that it's not really a th thought of as being a thing that would affect say the northwestern side of the United States or, or Western right. Canada. Yeah. Paul, do you want to add to that? Say that you know, we uh, we had a little chat about this the other day, and you know the, the term sting jets a pretty emotive one, and um, we just have to be careful that not every storm that has strong winds uh, is suddenly uh, classed as being one that has a sting jet. You know, they, generally, unless you have very high resolution observations, a lot of analysis of storms containing sting jets is done post storm event with high resolution modelling, and even then, you know, there's debate about which particular mechanism it is. So they're fascinating things, and um, uh, we should certainly focus on them. But uh, I think. You know, don't get too uh, sort of switched on by the emotivity of the uh, of the of the name Stingjet. Brilliant. No, nice way to close. And as as I mentioned earlier, we, the um, the first masterclass did have a uh, a third of the talk was on Stingjet. So again, a plug really if you want to learn a bit more about that to uh, to look at the recording from our first masterclass session. So can I thank Len and uh, Dan and Paul for um, answering those questions? A really interesting discussion, uh, clarification on some of the points there as well, Len. So uh, thanks very much for that. And I'm going to hand back to uh, to Andrew now, who will just close off this session. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just want to say again, echo Liz's thoughts there and, and say thanks to our, our fabulous speakers there. I think that was a really interesting discussion at the end as well that brought out lots of lots of great points. So uh, thank you to those uh, in the audience who, who asked some, some really great questions as well. Um, as Liz said, this is, um, you know, this is kind of a trial of, of running these masterclasses and we, I think we're really enjoying doing them and we're, and we're really thinking about doing a, another set of these masterclasses probably sometime in the spring. Um, and so we, we will be sending out a survey to, to everyone who, who has uh, come along today because we really want to find out, you know, what, what we can do to, to make these events as useful as possible, what topics uh, people might might be interested in, in covering. Um, and I think we, you know, we, we think that these, these series of linked uh, masterclasses is, is really the way to go. Uh, and I would just close by by encouraging you to come along to the to the final masterclass um, in the series, which will be in, in two weeks. Uh, and as Liz already uh, I, uh, introduced, that will be on on sub seasonal prediction of of winter storms and, and winter weather regimes. And I think that will form an interesting bridge between the two uh, two talks we've already had in the in the masterclass series from from Helen and Len. So. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, have a great evening and hopefully we'll see many of you uh, in a couple of weeks time.